Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guests are OBGYN Dr. Nathan Riley and Senior Check Faculty Member Angie Check. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, my partner in life, Angie Check, and my good friend and our family OBGYN, Nathan Riley, come back to share on the inner world of birth and parenting. This podcast is important for any couple planning on having children or that do have babies or children. Nathan, Angie, and I have an honest dialogue on low intervention birth and maternity care and the importance of physicians allowing a woman's natural intelligence to guide her birthing and delivery process as opposed to imposing upon a woman with medical interventions out of habit or programmed behavior as is so often with doctors in hospital settings during the birthing process and in early childhood. We talk about the importance of developing and maintaining a healthy gut microbiome when you're pregnant and when breastfeeding, and the implications to infants when mothers have an unhealthy gut microbiome, something that very few women or parents think about. We explore what is being missed in the modern healthcare system regarding breastfeeding and maternal neonate bonding with the mother. What are the ramifications of unnecessarily separating a newborn from the mother for largely unnecessary medical procedures? Angie, Nathan, and I explore the stages of childhood development and what parents need to know in order to best support these important stages of development with their children. We finish with Nathan explaining why children often get fevers, the importance of fevers for developing the immune system, and why doctors and parents should be more cautious about medicating children with fevers. Even if you're not an expecting parent or a parent with young children, if you are involved in any aspect of holistic health care, this is an important podcast with a lot of important information to be aware of because you're sure to be able to help others with it. Enjoy my dialogue with Nathan Riley, MD, our family OBGYN, and Angie Check, the mother of two my beautiful children and an amazing woman indeed with a lot of experience and skill to share with all of you. Have fun. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our topic of discussion is the inner world of birth and parenting with our family OBGYN, Nathan Riley, MD, somebody I love deeply, who is one hell of an amazing doctor. I wish there was much more like him out there, but there isn't. And we also have my beautiful wife, Angie Check in company today to share her perspectives on the topics that we're going to cover, which are extremely important, no matter who you are, because you were born and you (laughs) will die. And what happened in your neonatal experience and your birthing process is inextricably linked to the life you're living right now, for better or worse. So our journey today is to really look at things that we all need to be very, very aware of and look at what the medical system has done to the process beautifully designed over billions of years by Mother Nature. And so we're going to get into some very controversial topics. Nathan is a student of Rudolf Steiner's teaching in anthroposophic medicine, so he has an extremely holistic view with a lot of understanding and depth of experience. And he is hands down the best OBGYN and one of the most amazing surgeons I've ever known. And that's why I want to share him with you. We have had a previous podcast with Angie and Nathan and I on issues of birthing that was quite potent. So if you have not heard that, you might want to loop back. If you enjoy this one, you'll probably really enjoy that one. Welcome, Nathan. Thank you so much for having me. And you know, something I didn't get I think to share with you guys last time was just how grateful I am for the mentorship and the friendship that we've developed. I know that Angie and I had a really strong connection when we met for your birth, for the birth of Zoe. And um, I still feel that, that connection so strongly. The, um, you know, coming out of the conventional medical model and trying to create something new is a really, really energetically consuming. It's really hard to do that. It takes a lot of courage and having met you guys um, really did give me that that courage and that kind of final push. And I think without your support, I don't think I would be 
where I am today. So thank you for your ongoing support and your encouragement and your mentorship and your just just all around embodied individuals and you've helped me become an embodied man, a doctor, a father, um, and a friend. So thank you. Well yeah, thank you. I was really proud of you for doing HLC one and two, you know, as a medical doctor, that's as you know, very important training. And it shows you how to look at the body truly holistically and, and the emotions and the mind and how to work with the mind and how to coach people. Yeah. And it's not taught to medical doctors and it's, 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 not. it's a bad, bad situation. Yeah. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of, it's like you've gone through all the school and now it's time to learn something new. And that's scary. It's scary to have to say, well, gosh, look where I came from. Was that all for nothing? No, it was not for nothing, but it's only a piece of the story. And if we're not able to ask questions, if we're not able to, to, to like just sit in wonderment once in a while of the human experience, we, don't, we miss out on a big part of what this is. And, that, and in my work in birth and death, it, that, that sort of um, the, the embodiment of a, as a person that that requires um, is not an easy journey. So, um, so that's why it's been really helpful to have you guys there along the way with me. Well, you know, one of the things that, most doctors don't realize because the medical system, uh, thanks to Rockefeller, has turned human beings into objects. And now they're just data sets. And you can thank Bill Gates for the data set concept. He's pushing that to the extreme. So what happens is the doctor's not actually interacting with a person. They're interacting with what they think of as more like a biological machine, that this needs parts replaced and this chemical, that chemical, but it overlooks the soul of the individual. It overlooks the life of the individual. And it overlooks something that Jung drove home very clearly. In fact, I have an entire book on this. And that is that whenever two people get together, such as a doctor and a patient, there is a third being created out of both of them. And so what, why that's so critical for doctors and therapists to understand is because the third being, which Jung calls the third, is a marriage of the two of you. Just like when you have a child, it's the marriage of the two of you that produces that body of that child. And it carries both of you inextricably woven into it. So because of the way the medical system has oriented itself, doctors think that they're doing things to people. And that's where we have the problem with this treatment model. If, if I say I'm treating you to dinner, you automatically assume I'm paying. So when people go to doctors for treatment, they think they're just going to sell the doctor their problems and the doctor is going to fix everything and they're just going to walk out and it's all going to be fine again. Yeah, that's not how it works. No. And so the other part is, is that when a doctor objectifies a patient, he disconnects himself from the patient. The patient is external to him. But when a doctor is in a healthy relationship with a patient like Steiner, taught and many others body spirit and soul Jung and and a long list of geniuses then the doctor's in a real-time learning experience and the doctor is actually learning from the patient because the patient's wisdom is infused into him or her as the third and his wisdom is infused into the patient as the third and that's what transference is so if a doctor's healthy and grounded and centered there's a transference of that energy into the patient. If the doctor understands diet, lifestyle, relationships, then the doctor can actually use that wisdom and their own life experience to not only teach the person, but there's an unconscious transfer of wisdom energetically in the third. And if, if the doctor avoids the responsibility of relationship, then the person becomes an object or a machine, or as I said, a data set, and healing is seriously um, hampered. Yeah. It's, it's very dangerous, and it's got us to where we're at now <clears throat> in the medical system. What you're describing is something you've described in a lot of conversations in the past, and that we've talked a lot about personally, which is, you know, it's this Cartesian, dualistic, reductionistic, materialistic way of looking at 
the experience of being human. And if you, you haven't gone there yourself, if you haven't actually done that deep soul search, and we just did two days of it, <laughs> if you haven't done that work, it's very, very hard to become an embodied present person because, because there's not a community, there's not, there's not, you don't understand the communication between, you know, whether it be a mother and a baby or a, a um, physician or a caretaker, a death doula, and a person who's passing over. Like, this is a relationship, and we're, we're emerging as a separate entity altogether, which is why I think I feel such a connection to you. And I feel a connection to all of my patients when I'm actually present there. But physicians are not taught to do that. That's the, un, in, the intangible part of medical training that you can't quantify. There's no metric for that. Did you do well on the exam? And um, that's something that comes from experience and with presence and with love. You know, we need to be leading with love and compassion in medicine. And instead, love and compassion come way behind. And that is really, really damaging, not just the physician-patient relationship. It's not just damaging the public's trust in the medical system. It's damaging our society. It's damaging our kids. It's damaging our, our relationships and our friendships. It's, it's, it's hampering our ability to become embodied individuals. And, and the, the emergent reality of that model is, is what's going on in the world right now. Isolation, masks, right. segregation, <laughs> You're exactly forced right. injections. It is it's like the, 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 the shadow manifested. It's dark. Oh, God. Yeah. It's dark and it's, it's very like, dangerous. Like we're not wanting, wanting to feel anymore. No, <sighs> don't show motion. Don't yeah. show concern. Suck it up. Keep on moving. Go, go, go. Work, work, work. Do what you're told. Do what you're told. Don't ask questions. Keep on going. You know, and it's like, wait, what about grief? And what about sorrow? What about these other emotions that we are feeling and that we're being told to ignore? Yeah. You know, and, and censorship is killing our ability to express our true um, values, our true emotions are true concerns and so once you start censoring you disable uh, the flow of energy and emotion you know i describe love love as the flow of energy and information through empathic and compassionate connection to self and or other so once you start censoring you disable the flow of energy and information wow. through empathic and compassionate connection because now you're afraid to say what's true for you so it's like a child that keeps getting told to shut up. The child learns not to talk, and all that emotion gets bottled up inside of it. And it reminds me of a quote by Jung. He says, We have killed the mythical gods and relegated them to the solar plexus. Wow. Now that's a deep that statement. That is a deep statement. Mm -hmm. Okay. What he means is when we stopped understanding mythology and realizing what it really was, then gods like Zeus and Isis and all the other beings that connect us to the, you know, archetypal root language of consciousness gets disabled. So what has to happen is we have to push those forces down into our solar plexus. And then they manifest as disease and neurosis and psychopathology. And Jung predicted that the outcome of that would be physicians that were pathological psychologically. And one of the things he said in that same statement, it was they would unleash pandemics on the world. And he said that in about 1950-something. Wow. Right? Sounds about it, right. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a... It's a situation that will not change from the medical system out because they're totally invested in money. It's all about money. It's got to change from the ground up. The, the people going to doctors have to shop for real doctors and they have to demand real patient care and they have to be much more discerning of diet and lifestyle factors as we're going to get into because if they don't, they're going to die. They're going to lose children. They're going to lose their life. I have seen many women completely and utterly annihilate themselves after the second or third child because they did not know how to regenerate themselves between births. You know, my mother gave birth to three kids in a row. Wow. One year after the other. I mean, that is enough to practically kill a woman. In Native American cultures, many of them would not allow a woman 
to have sexual interactions with a man for three years after she gave birth because they found that if she had a baby sooner than every three years, the chances of the woman dying in the process of childbearing or in the recovery was so high it completely disabled the tribe. Wow. And that's one of the reasons they didn't practice monogamy because it was too hard for men to wait three years to have sex with their partner. So well, that makes a lot of sense. A man could have sex with other women. Well, he loved and cared for his wife, but his whole function was to support her regeneration, which medicine men and um, wise elders and the shaman uh, were the orchestrators of to determine when she was ready. You know, it, it always boggles my mind how the medical system tends to refer to these uh, ancient cultures as antiquated, stupid, backwards. But the truth is the reverse. These people knew how to survive with a lot less technology than we did. And they were much more connected to the earth and much connected to the forces of nature. And they knew the importance of ritual. They knew the importance of community, of tribe, of, of sharing the load. And this is where the saying, it takes a tribe to raise a child comes from. It really does. And, and we've got this Christian dogma and isolation and segregation and ethnocentric religious ideals coupled with scientific materialism. And it is a formula for world destruction. It really is. And the medical system has its fingers in every part of culture. No one isn't touched by the medical system. That's right. Especially that's, that's right. This is important. This is important. These conversations are important. So your specialty is low intervention birth and maternity care. Can you explain to us what low intervention birth and maternity care really are or should be? Yeah, and um, I'm just going to allude back to sort of some of our conversations uh, about Angie's birth. Um, one thing that I, I get questions about a lot is what am I allowed to um, to refuse when I go into the hospital? I think that question there embodies the the problem, right? Women feel that when they become pregnant, that they no longer have say over their body. It's now some doctor or nurse practitioner or midwife or somebody who's actually telling them what's going to happen. So much so that we actually feel like, you know, when I go to the hospital, am I allowed to refuse IV fluids? Am I allowed to do this and that? And this medical system has trained us to feel like once you enter the hospital, things just happen to you. And part of that is we talked about, in our, I think, in our last conversation that we, we don't really do informed consent anymore, right? Nor do we honor your right to refuse treatment. And so to go back to your birth, if I may, mm -hmm, sure. you were, you were, um, you were struggling for almost three days in labor. And I think you were at eight centimeters and, you know, your midwife, Nicole, was there and we were trying to get the you know, Zoe not asynclitic and get her in the right position. It just wasn't working. But you were in control that whole time. Yes. And I kept checking in with you to say, hey, listen, here's where we're at. Let's revisit this conversation. And we just pushed it and pushed it and pushed it. And then finally, it wasn't a matter of giving up. It was that you had decided based on conversations with your soul and your process, this is, this what, is I wanted to do. what I want to do. And that that is the, the cornerstone of fixing the maternity care system in the United States. And I'm young, so this is my this is my whole career path. And people are going to want to fire me and cancel me or whatever. But giving women the right to say what happens to their bodies is has never been more important. So a low intervention birth would look like, let's get out of the way of the physiology of natural childbirth. The problem with uh, physicians doing that is that many of them don't even get to see physiologic childbirth. I've been, I've, I've, I, maybe it's a privilege of mine that I've gotten to see that happen, working with midwives and going you mean to home natural homes. childbirth, natural Without sort of yeah, yeah, like no intervention childbirth. Let's just see what can happen. Now, that's not to say that modern healthcare is not there. I mean, we we're talking about C sections. You had two C sections. There's a good reason to be doing this, but to think that we should be delivering, you know, fifty percent of kids through an abdominal incision, that to me is so dystopic. It is. You know, where we're just like, oh, it's cool, it's cool if we just do these C sections. Yes, we can do it safely, but what is being lost in the process through maternal bonding, through the the immediate need to have that baby on your chest while you're in crucifix style on the on the operating room table? And I know that we did things differently in your birth, but that's not the experience of many women. 
So my goal here is not to say, hey, we need to be doing things differently. It's we need to scrap that whole entire process of counseling women about their bodies, educating them from the very beginning as to what this might look like. Get people into birth to see what natural physiologic childbirth looks like. And then the rest is easy because you get to see how the more the more stuff we do to you, Pitocin, artificial rupture of membranes, epidurals, even though they sometimes are necessary, C-sections, episiotomies, vacuums, all these things that we have said, hey, we're here to be the hero and save the day. Yes, it does prevent the baby or mom from dying, but we're doing those things because we started intervening way before we should have, as opposed to letting your body play this process out to the best of its ability and for us to support you. It's like what you always say, Paul, I'm not treating disease, I'm guiding you to health. Yes. We don't treat the disease that has the person, we coach the person that has the disease. And there's another factor that I'd like to throw on the table here with all the C-sections. And from my research into it, one of the most common reasons for C-sections is women don't want their vaginas stretched out and they don't want to go through the pain of a natural childbirth. And that all goes back to the negative influences of the, of the modeling and fashion industry. Women are more concerned about their aesthetics than they are about giving birth. And that is a very sick disease. Oh. Well, that's with breastfeeding too. They're like, oh, it's going to stretch my boobs out. So I don't want to breastfeed. So I want my boobs to stay perky. And so they avoid breastfeeding because it's like, oh, that's going to pull on my breasts and they're going to sag and that's going to make me look old and I'm not going to lo longer look beautiful. Right. Yeah. I mean, this whole conversation, I think, really goes back even further than just when a woman gets pregnant. But as, you know, young adults, women need to know how to take care of the body and listen to their body because anytime there's a problem as a young girl, it's like, go to the doctor and they're going to fix you. And they never learn how to feel what their body truly needs. They don't know how to eat right. They you know it's like, take this medication. They don't learn to sense what they really, really need. So if you're been brought up in this medical industry, you think about it. Like you're taught, I have a headache, you take an aspirin. I have a tummy ache, I take a Tums. I take this, I take right, that. Right. So why would my birth be any different? Because I have been indoctrinated into that philosophy and that's why women don't know how to give birth because they have never been taught to think and feel for themselves. So they don't even know. So I think a lot of women get scared and they want to be more participatory in their own birth, but they can't because they don't even know what their body needs because they've been numbed from day one. And that's part of the problem too. It's like, they do need HLC1 training and they need to learn how to take care and feel their body before they even have that conversation. Because I think a lot of women don't know. They're like, yeah. feel what? I don't know what I'm supposed to be feeling. I don't know what the body needs. I don't know what the baby needs. You know, and that's important. You know, it's like I could feel my children in me and I could sense their energies were very different. From the, I was like, wow, this one wants me to eat fish. This one doesn't want fish. This one wants chicken. This one doesn't want. And honoring that because, you know, a lot of women go, oh, I need to eat this. And they force food in their stomachs because they think it's what they need. And it often makes them sick. And Somebody gave them a list of these are the good foods as opposed to actually checking in. Is this saying, a good food for me? It's like, yeah, if you're eating healthy food, all of it's good. But like, you know, it's mana. I couldn't eat a salad to save my life. It's like I could not eat it. I could eat a cucumber. You know, I could eat a tomato, but I couldn't eat them mixed together. It was like, don't do that. With Zoe, it's like eat a big salad with mixed vegetables. And so honoring that child and that soul because they have unique needs. And so feeling that, understanding that. I had visions of my children, what they were like before they were born. And that they, they are exactly like those visions. And so a lot of women don't connect in that way. And so it's like, then you're told, how does your baby feel right now? I don't know. Put a monitor on me. And I could feel. And that's why at one point in my birth of Zoe, I was like, I think I need to change gears now. Because she was fine. She was fine. I knew she was fine. But there was a point in me that I'm like, okay, I can feel she's getting stuck and um, this is becoming a problem. And so I could feel when that initially started, but until then I was like, I can, I want to do this. I want to fight for this, but knowing when you know what to do, you know, and, and having that opportunity. And I, and I feel like I was fully in control of my birth. So I don't have any regrets, you know, with, with Mon, it was the opposite. It was like, oh my gosh, emergency, he's going to die. And it was like, take this baby out. And I didn't have any control. And that was like, I feel like, yes, I have this beautiful son, but I had a loss of the experience because it was taken away from me. Like, you don't know what's going on. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm feeling my child and he's fine. But they're like telling me he's not. I'm like, no, I know he is, you know? And, you know, that. Like, heaven forbid you have some sort of intuitive, um, I don't know, nature as to what's happening with Mana or Zoe, you know, whatever, you know, baby, my wife's pregnant right now. She is so in tune with that baby. And in, childbirth, what we do is like, we say, oh no, 
you know, stupid woman, you couldn't possibly know. Let's put you on this monitoring system, which we call fetal heart rate monitoring. It's the the. Oh yeah, we we know all about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, what... and they force you to to have it, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And, yeah. And it doesn't matter how many times I tell them, hey, this does not need to be continuous. The baby's totally fine. There's moderate variability. There's accelerations. We don't need to be doing this continuously. It's causing you harm. And potentially that stress and response stress. is actually affecting your labor. So this is what we talk about with low intervention birth. Let's not do those things. <laughs> when we Angie went for her last checkup with Mana, you remember I told you the morning you left, I said, I don't feel good about this. Something bad's going to happen. I don't want you to go to this checkup. Something, I just felt uneasy about it. And sure enough, I got a call at two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm in an emergency state. You need to come to the hospital. I need to know what, what you think I should do. <clears throat> but there's two things that came up. One one of the problems is that so many mothers that get pregnant do not have a regular exercise routine. They don't take care of themselves. The number of overweight and obese women I see pregnant is shocking. It's absolutely shocking. That is not a person who is ready for the rigors of childbirth. I mean, if you can't deal with gravity... I got news for you. That childbirthing process will kick your ass. You're dealing with something far more intense than a marathon. Yeah, there's a, uh, <laughs> this is a, <laughs> this is the fight of your life. And I know that you were there. I remember seeing it. I will never get that look out of your face, but <laughs> I've seen it with my own wife. Like you are the goddess embodied. And people do not realize this is not a medical procedure. This is a rite of passage. This is a beautiful, sacred thing. It's a spiritual process. It's a spiritual process, way more than it is a physical. And while there are physical elements, gosh, that transition from maiden to motherhood is something that that when we hook you up to monitors and we try to quantify and, and put some metric on, you know, how is the baby doing through an unvalidated software it's program, algorithms. by the way. Exactly, exactly. And we know the more we try to, to, to quantify things, the less we actually fall out of line with our intuition. It's like you said, we don't want to have to think, we don't want to have to feel. Let's just have somebody tell us the magic number. You know, and we know it doesn't work. We don't have great mortality and morbidity statistics in the United States. Of all of the developed nations, the United States falls way behind, not just in healthcare. I know you've brought up the WHO reports from 2002, but also just in maternal and, and, and uh, maternal and uh, neonatal morbidity and mortality. We're stuck in this place where it's like we're trying to throw more numbers and more quantification of labor. Why? Because. <laughs> For every deviation from the algorithm, it's a drug or a procedure, a billable process. You know, Revenue. Uh, if you look at Biochemical Individuality by Roger Williams, have you ever read that book? No, I haven't. That's a freaking good book. Roger Williams, one of the world's f- most elite physiologists, shows the medical system has created parameters for so tight for every measure from hormones to physiology that it's impossible for the average person to not fall out of their normal reference range so they get prescribed drugs. Mm. They narrowed this. He showed, for example, that within one family, there can be a 1,000% difference in the liver's ability to clear any molecule or drug like alcohol at the same dinner table. So he showed that there are people with cholesterol rates of a total of 1,000 that are completely healthy. Wow. So he showed <laughs> over and over again that the medical system has completely and utterly distorted physiological norms specifically to sell drugs and procedures. And it's disgusting. I think so too. It's sickening. The other thing too is that I was mentioning exercise because when you exercise regularly, especially if you use weightlifting or uh, sports that require agility, such as tennis or soccer, where there's a lot of hand-eye coordination, those activities bring you into deep contact with your body. Things like Zumba. Zumba is a very good type of exercise for women because it's very dynamic. There's balance, there's coordination, there's strength components, there's endurance. So it really puts them into a relationship with their body where they learn their bodies. They learn how to listen to their bodies, how to move their bodies, how to have a relationship. And when you start getting tired and you got to push yourself, you need to be able to maintain good form. So you got to keep your mind centered in your body. 
But when people sit on spin bikes and watch television, that's just it's you're you're back to the machine model. You 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 know walking is about a million times more complex neurologically than riding a spin bike. So just walking is a million times better of an exercise because you're actually using your own center of gravity over your own base of support. You have to balance yourself. Gait is 85% single-legged activity. You're on one leg 85% of the time when you're walking. So it's a series of controlled falls. And so we've created a, an exercise industry that looks just like the medical system. And it's very dysfunctional as, you know, I've been lecturing on this for as long as, you know, since Christ <laughs> was a cowboy. But the, the other component I wanted to share is a term I made up to express what's going on with women, especially people that are trying to use cesarean sections to avoid the uh, changes in their aesthetics. I call it externalization of the self. You see, when people are too driven by what they see in the mirror, they push their consciousness up to the surface of their body. And the cost of that is you're not paying attention to what's going on in the core of your body. A classic example of this is bodybuilding. As a field, bodybuilding is the epitome of the externalization of the self. Their whole sense of identity is based on what other people think of them and what they see in the mirror. And the fashion industry is all about creating insecurity about whether or not you're up to date, whether you have the coolest fashions, the makeup industry, the cosmetics industry. It pulls people into the surface of themselves. So when a person begins to relate to themselves in the mirror, they're actually having a relationship with a part of themselves that's not alive. And here's how I make this point to my students. Can the image in the mirror brush its own teeth? No. It can't. So when you put your life force into the mirror, you're projecting your consciousness into an image of yourself that is not alive. The image in the mirror is made of the light being projected out of your body, bouncing off the mirror. So if you worship what's in the mirror, the you're, you're actually worshiping a chimera, a mirage, and you're letting the mirage direct your life, but the mirage is outside of you. So your sense of identity becomes based on what you're seeing in a mirror or what other people think about False you, gods. which leads you to no man's land because you can never make everybody happy. No matter how beautiful a woman is, and I've known a lot of beautiful women. I'm married to two of them. No matter how beautiful, I, I love Angie's body. Like Angie is one of the most beautiful women naked I've ever seen in my life. But there are guys that would not like that body style. So if Angie's sense of self was dependent upon getting a congruent sense of approval from men, she would find herself really stuck. Yeah. Like, why does this guy love me and this guy not? How do I get love there? And so you end up seeing all sorts of plastic surgery and compensations to try to get love from the outside. And it leaves a woman completely out of touch with her soul. Her whole sense of self is pushed out to the surface. And that is a disease in our culture worldwide. And, and you can thank the fashion industry and the modeling industry and the bodybuilding industry and the cosmetics industry for doing that for people. And billions and billions, if not trillions of dollars spent marketing to hook people into thinking if your lips just look a bit better, if you have permanent eyeliner, uh, you know, this stuff toxic, is toxic and dangerous. And when women come from that mindset into becoming a mother, they are totally and utterly ill-equipped oh, yeah. for the relationship that they are um, inherently responsible for they are disconnected from the life inside of themselves if you can't connect to the life in your own body as a woman you will never connect to your child and that child now becomes an object more like a tumor growing in your body it's like an accessory yeah, yeah. did you know that symbiotica means harmony and you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Sherveen Jafariah the founder of symbiotica 
Symbiotic is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to Symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Sheila J Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis Liposomal Glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. How does gut dysbiosis in the mother affect the gut microbiome of the child? And what are the consequences of the mother's lack of health on the fetus itself? So this is a big one. This is a really, really challenging one that the the medical... uh the conventional medical model is not really talking a lot about. There is There are some people that are starting to gather the pieces. But even when I was in residency, there was this, this trend too. And I think you guys may have done this with Zoe, where you swab the vagina and then, and then try to we did it with impregnate. Both yeah. That was a pretty unpopular thing to do. But it makes a lot of sense, right? We know that 85% of the immune system is in the gut, right, through lymphocytes and neutrophils and it's macrophages. It's in all mucous membranes. Se- all mucous secretory membranes. IgA, 80, 89, 86 to 89% of it lines your secretory IgA. Uh, 80, 86 to 89% of secretory IgA, which is your primary immune defense, first contact defense, lines all mucous membranes. Eyes, mouth, nose, vagina, rectum. And interestingly enough, I don't know if you know this, you might from HLC2 training, but one of the first symptoms that somebody's... Um, got too high a cortisol level is that they start having problem with any of the mucous membranes, such as styes in the eye, sores in the nose, sores in the mouth, sores in the vagina, sores in the rectum. Yeah, we get a suppression of the immune system. And so what we put into our gut is going to feed some bacteria preferentially. And if if those are the beneficial bacteria, then you're going to have a healthy gut. If it's feeding the opportunistic bacteria, you're going to have a dysregulated gut or dysbiosis. When the baby comes through the vagina, it doesn't happen through the abdominal incision, which is why I'm glad you guys did that. But when it comes, when the baby comes through the vagina, the baby is picking up whatever that balance of beneficial to opportunistic uh, bacteria, it's going to pick up that balance and that's going to be populating your baby. So in many ways, generationally, this is actually how we may be passing through autoimmune issues or psychiatric issues. I mean, Gutten gotten, um, in Psychology Syndrome was a pretty classic book by Natasha Campbell and it was pretty controversial. It still is controversial. But when we think Anything about Anything that's true is controversial. Well, <laughs> that's, so tr- that's true in and of itself. Including telling the truth these days. Yeah. Yeah, right. So so what I tell people when they're pregnant is whatever you're putting in there, also your baby's getting the benefits, right? We need all those bacteria in the gut to absorb a wide variety of micronutrients and vitamins um, and to keep some of these, these potentially pathogenic bacteria at bay. So prebiotic, fiber, you know, probiotic, those are all things that we incorporate into our diet um, sort of on a routine basis. And what I always tell women is, if you're going to start trying to get pregnant, let's talk about some of these possible dermatoses. Let's talk about some of the GI issues you have, IBS, SIBO. Let's start looking into that now because the baby's under (laughs) direct influence of whatever you've put in there in the past and whatever makeup of bacteria you've got going on in your gut now. Um, I can't tell you how many women come and they think they've got issues with their ovaries or their uterus or whatever else, and they've just got a nasty case of chronic colitis. It may be low grade or they've got IBS or they've got SIBO or something like that. We need to work up, work that up. Dyspepsia, the reflux, like how many people are in PPIs and how important is stomach acid for absorption of nutrients? You guys What's talk PPI? about- PPI? Uh, like a protein pump inhibitor or a, a proton pump inhibitor, decreasing the stomach 
acid production. Oh, that's one of the biggest it's a no no mistakes. Yeah, right, right. I've had countless people diagnosed with low hydrochloric acid. And I have a simple solution. It's called a Heidelberg test. Heidelberg capsule test. Are you familiar with it? Yeah, I, th- I think you taught I think you taught us about that in HLC too, if yeah. I recall. Yeah. Every single person in my entire career that was diagnosed by a physician as having too much stomach acid and put on antacids had low HCL production. That, my friend, is the fastest way to get yourself a severe parasite infection. Once your hydrochloric acid production goes, you've got nothing to kill parasites. That is your first line of defense against pathogens in food. And people burn themselves out. Hydrochloric acid production drops down. Aaron Fried Pfeiffer showed that in research of thousands of people, that by the time people were 35 years old, on average, they had about the hydrochloric acid production of a 70-year-old, which is devastating. So, you know, I I have watched so many people get misdiagnosed. It's uh, it's disturbing. It really is. We probably disturbing. should explain about how that happens. Is that when you have the low stomach acid, um, your sphincters open up, and so it causes GERD. So they have this burning in their esophagus, and they think, oh, it's too much, but actually it's too little. So when you add more, it tightens those sphincters. So. Those who are listening don't know how that happens. And PPIs, those proton pump inhibitors I was talking about, like omeprazole, those types of things. When you put somebody on that for longer than like two weeks, you get a compensatory hormonal response of gastrin, which is going to tell you that, hey, if you take me off of that PPI, you've got all this gastrin floating around. It stimulates the production of, 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 of HCL in the gut. And then you end up with an overcompensation and too much stomach acid. And then you actually are getting this nasty acid burps because you get an ulcer. Yeah, exactly. So, so PPIs, whenever they first came out, I'm pretty sure the drug manufacturers, I can't remember who it was, but they had said, this is a two week medication, but I've seen people, especially women who are approaching, you know, the, the older years, right? My hospice and palliative care patients, they've been on a PPI for 25 years. That's just stupid. Wow. And, and now they're developing, you know, cognitive issues and everything else. And it's like, you're, you're missing all of your nutrients. You need stomach acid. And who knows, you maybe have a parasite. You may have an overgrowth of candida. You might have some crazy other or imbalance. Or all of them. Or all of the I've above. I've seen all of them at once. I've had people with 16 parasite infections at once and the fungal infection from hell. Wondering why they feel like shit all the time and never gotten any effective diet intervention or li- lifestyle intervention from doctors at all. It, <clears throat> so it's, it's a, it, you know, what we're highlighting is the very fucked up situation <laughs> the medical system's in. But what I'm highlighting is it is not going to change because it is not a healthcare model. It's a disease maintenance model. It's a business model. We palliate has, symptoms. has nothing to do with helping people heal other than surgical intervention, um, which a lot of that's unnecessary. So we have got to change this from the ground up. If, if we don't buy it, they can't make money off of it. Amen. So it's a matter of doctors like you All the money. creating centers for women to go to get real medical help, you know, holistic, integrated medicine with the intention of educating people how to regain the wisdom of the body because no matter how smart a doctor is all that doctor's knowledge compared to what's in a woman's body is a thimble next to the ocean that's <laughs> that's so right and and to and to even um, project that further every doctor does not have all the answers i i rely on you guys a lot and your teachings and you in the books you recommend me to and and you know other HLC or check practitioners like Sarah Gustafson and, and some other really great people that I'm working on some projects with. Like, I need your help too. Like, I don't have all the answers. I'm not saying, hey, come to the doctor because he has all the answers. I'm saying, hey, I'm a doctor that's saying I don't have all the answers. But that's exactly why we're going to try to, we're going to be able to get down to the, the issue. We're not just going to put a band aid on that. It's going to take some patience. It's going to take some time, but we'll work through this. We'll get you feeling better. The, the whole I built the whole Czech Institute on, on a multidisciplinary model. That's great. Every Czech professional is taught to graduate level four. You have to answer questions on how to refer to nineteen different allied healthcare and healthcare professionals. I need to know you know when you need a neurologist, an endocrinologist, a psychologist, a Feldenkrais practitioner, an Alexander practitioner, a dance and movement educator, 
uh, an internal medicine doctor, uh, a liver specialist, a kidney, a cancer specialist, an orthopedist. Um, if my practitioners cannot make that distinction, then they will do the most dangerous thing. There's an old saying, if all you got in your pocket is a hammer, everything, everything looks, looks like, like an ale. <laughs> and so there's another saying, you see what you treat and you treat what you see, which means whatever you were taught in, in school, whatever your profession is, you can't see outside of that framework. And I built the entire institute by studying with every kind of doctor and therapist I could and working with them. And I ran a multidisciplinary uh, pain uh, control, pain management group for years where I chose 13 of the best doctors and therapists I could find. And every couple of months we'd get together and bring our toughest cases and we would share those cases. And then each doctor or therapist would say what their approach would be to that patient. And everybody else got to hear how they would approach it. And it was mind blowing. Wow. You, you learn stuff like you had no freaking idea that wow. that was what was going on. And you went, holy shit, I never knew anything like that. I'd love to be a fly on the wall during <laughs> the, one of those sessions. That would be <laughs> incredible. I started that for my own selfish reasons because I knew the best 13 people in San Diego from years of working in the area and studying them. And they were all avid learners. And I had many of the greatest doctors in town and therapists. And they were all just fascinated by what they were learning. I did that for probably two years before it just was hard for everybody to get to the meetings. And we sort of dissolved a little bit uh, and just went back to our normal state. But we got a couple of years of really good education out of each other. If you have all the answers, you've got nothing else to learn, right? So they, in academic medicine, they used to do this thing called mortality and uh, what do they call it? M&M, &M, uh, mortality and morbidity conference, right? And you would take the bad things. Let's talk about the bad outcomes, right? Let's say in surgery, a patient died or something was confused or, you know, and, and, and what you do is you stand up and you say, I made this mistake and you present to your colleagues who then say, wow, that's tricky. I guess we could have, tr maybe you could have done this better. Maybe this would have helped you fix this dilemma you ran into or prevent that from happening. And um, I will tell you now in medicine, doctors and other providers, we're so tied to the idea that we need to have the answer that mortality and morbidity conferences are a thing of the past in the way that they used to be practiced. But that's where you would learn how, did, how can I avoid this mistake? Instead, you just become further ingrained in your own habits. You find the data and you take those little anecdotes of when it did work and you let that color your whole practice. But that's obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> that doesn't work anywhere. So why would that be in, 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 in the hands of the, the people who think they're gods in the, surgeon, in, in the operating room? And it goes for all types of doctors or practitioners. If you're not willing to say, hmm, I think I could have done that better. Like, have you just reached the pinnacle? Are you the hermit at the top of the hill? You have nothing else to learn now and you're going to come down and share your information? Um, I think that I think that where many of us should feel, and Paul, I think that what you and actually, Andrew, I think what you guys both do so well um, is that you're willing to say, I'm still down here. I'm always trying to improve the practice. And the humility that that, that you bring to, to your practice to the care of people. I mean, I've just seen it with some of my, some of my buddies here these past couple of days is like, I don't know if this is going to work, but let's try this. And if it doesn't, let's then reposition ourselves. That is such a, a humbling and a, um, and a compassionate way to care for another person. But if we come to it with the answer, again, like you said, everything looks like a nail. And that's not a healthy place for us to be. I don't know how we get out of that, but I'm trying to I'm trying to steer us in well, a I different direction. Well, I think it's so, so everybody's so afraid of lawsuits and everything, so you have to guard it. And you're like, I'm always right. And if you're not, if you're wrong, then that's an opportunity for someone to sue you. So everybody's so afraid of that that they have to pretend they're right even when they're not. You yeah, know? it's and no so, longer the practice of medicine, right? Because you're, yeah. if you make a mistake, then so I think that's the problem. It's just it goes right. That whole model goes right to what's going on with COVID in the world right now. Because, as I'm sure you're aware, the, the, there was a study done by Harvard over 10 years to look at vaccine injuries versus vaccine injuries reported. And they found conclusively that for every one reported injury, there's at least 10 that are unreported. And another study said it was one to 100. For every wow. one, 
there was a hundred not reported. So you see, we're seeing these statistics that they're giving us, but we don't realize it is far worse than that because physicians do not want to report vaccine injuries or drug overdoses because it can kick your malpractice insurance up 20 or 30,000 bucks a year. So they're like sweeping that shit under the rug, man. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, you could use that example and look out elsewhere. Like birth control pills are a great example. We talked a little bit about this last time. Um, women for years have been saying, I don't feel well on a birth control pill. And doctors have been saying, yeah, the evidence doesn't support that. Well, <laughs> bullshit. Well, well I, I'm, I'm here right now and I'm telling you, I'm not feeling well. Can I come off of the medicine? Yeah, sure. But that's not it or whatever. And then of course they feel better. My wife went through this when we were young, when we were kids. And um, she lost her vitality. She lost the curliness of her beautiful Mexican hair. She lost, she lost that like that 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 zest. And she's a zesty woman. <laughs> Have you ever seen the book? I think it's called The Bitter Pill by Ellen Grant. Yeah, that's a great book. That's a ball buster. It is. Yeah. She wrote that report for the British government, the National Institute of Health. She did mountains of research on the pill, and she clearly showed it was. Freaking dangerous, and they did it anyhow. Speaking of gut dysbiosis, birth control pills, nasty for the gut. Oh, nasty, nasty, so. nasty. And how many women are taking hormonal contraception? It's not to say that it's not a, 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 an option, it's just that what we do is we say, Oh, you've got this problem, let's just put you on the pill without thinking. There is, we, we are more than just the sum of parts. There's something, there, there, we are complex biodynamic organisms. You know, doing that. As an analogy, is like a woman wearing a pair of high-heeled shoes that are a size and a half too small. <laughs> She'll force them on, and they might look pretty, but it'll ruin her feet. You know, you take the pill, and yes, you can have sex, but the metaphor is it's ruining your body, and your days are numbered. My analogy I have is that you go to this doctor, and the doctor says, take your shoes off when you come to the office, and they, everybody takes their shoes off, all the patients put their shoes by the door. And so like little me would come in and I have my size six and a half shoe or something and I leave them by the door and I go see the doctor and I come back and I don't see my shoes. And they say, well, just take another pair. And I put on these size 13 <laughs> basketball player shoes. And I say, doctor, these shoes are way too big. And he goes, well, let me see. The human foot is about size six to a size 13. You know, you're, 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 in, the, you're in the range, so they should be fine. I'm like, but these feel too big. Yep, well, you're in range, so you should be feeling fine. And then that basketball player comes out and he tries on my little shoes and says, doctor, <laughs> these shoes are way too tight. And the doctor says, well, let's see, size shoe. Yep, it's in the range of the na natural normal size of a foot. Those shoes should be fitting great. Yeah, you, and you've so got the doctor, no, no, now no this basketball here. player is wearing these little tiny <laughs> shoes thinking I'm in range. And so, you know, that range can be yeah. best. So, you know, yeah. just because you're in a range doesn't mean you feel right. And so you could do blood tests. You could do all sorts of things. It might be in range, but it's not right for your biochemistry. Yeah. And, the, and the ranges are fictitious, as I was saying. That's what Roger Williams That's pointed out. Great. Great metaphor. You know, I, I love quoting Marie-Louise von Franz to, to point the dangers of algorithms out. She says, you realize you could have a one-ton pile of stones with an average weight of two kilograms and then weigh each one of them and there will be not a single stone that weighs two kilograms. Wow. You see the point. So if we're all a stone, a patient going to a doctor but the average weight is two kilograms. So you try to make everything work for a two kilogram person, let's say, but nobody is one of those stones. And that is what happens when you turn people into data sets. You try to force mm -hmm. them into a set of numbers, mm -hmm. but the human being and the human body and the human physiology and the human psyche is wildly dynamic, yeah. wildly dynamic. It's just crazy. It's, it, it's what makes life so interesting. It's what makes us individuals. There is nobody in the world like you. There's no other Angie, no other Nathan, no other Paul, and there never freaking will be. And so if we don't get individuality back into medicine, which requires an individual relationship and an evaluation of physical, emotional, and mental and spiritual factors, because they tell you how the psyche is dealing with the internal physiology and biochemistry, right? If, 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 if I take Angie's testosterone levels up to my levels, it will radically alter her personality and her relationship with herself. 
And God forbid she get hornier than that. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> but you see, and there's research done on that. I've seen research studies where they ejected men and brought them up to the average levels of estrogen of a woman. And they said all they wanted to do is pet babies and cry all the time, and it drove them crazy. And they brought women up to the average level of testosterone of a typical male, and they said all they wanted to do is screw and fight all the time. And I said, good, now you know what it's like. <laughs> you know? That sounds familiar, yeah. But the point I'm making is this one molecule, and it radically alters a person's psychic experience of themselves and relationships. So when we don't realize how powerful these hormones are, and you know, even vitamins. That's it saying, just like supplements. They say, take two tablets in the morning. Well, little me weighing 120 pounds versus a female that weighs 185 pounds, we're supposed to take the same dose. You know, so I always tell people, we teach HLC2 out of Soul Connect and asking your body, what do I need? Do I need one pill, two pills? Do I need any of these pills? Because sometimes we're so quick to say, I need this vitamin, I need this supplement. And it's like, do you really? And maybe you need it today, but do you need it tomorrow? And always checking in with yourself because you might find that today I need to support myself with extra boost of immune system supplements. And then tomorrow it says, I'm good. Yeah, but exactly. just that you don't need a boosted every single day, you know, and sometimes you need more, sometimes you need less. But the p pill says to take two every day. And so you get programmed to believe I need two. And it's like, what's that based on? You know, and so do I need all that? That's why we teach soul connection, muscle testing, and logging. So you have three levels of intervention and you have to mature into soul connection. But um, there's something I want to point out, and that is that there's an excellent book I've studied thoroughly called Science and Agriculture by Arden Anderson, who's a rare guy. He's got a PhD in soil science. He's an MD. He's an aerospace doctor. Wow. He, he's an Air Force doctor. Jeez. And he takes care of, you know, fighter jet pilots and stuff like that. But in science and agriculture, he makes a profound point. He said vitamins were named vitamins, but they're not really vitamins. He says vitamins are plant hormones. Every vitamin the, and almost every hormone in your body can be found in the rhizosphere of a plant, meaning the root space. If you do a biochemical analysis on the root space of plants, almost every hormone that we have, they have. Wow. So what he's pointing out is that we have developed this relationship with vitamins as though they're something else like food supplements. But what he's saying is they're actually plant hormones and they're as powerful as hormones. And if you don't understand that, then you get all these people popping piles of pills, not realizing they're completely screwing their biochemistry up. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down? It's Organifi Immunity. Organifi Immunity is a super high quality certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta-glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get on-the-go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high quality drinking water and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods and great taste that's quick easy, and effective. To get your Organifi Immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to organifi.com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. What is being missed in the modern healthcare system regarding breastfeeding and maternal neonate bonding? And, you know, this is an area that triggers the shit out of me. I'll let oh you know. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I've studied this extensively, and it pisses me off. There is an utter underappreciation for the spiritual process of birth, as we've mentioned. 
and the connection that a mother is developing with her baby in the womb, which leads to the intuitive process that you described in determining, hey, I think it's time to change courses or whatever. But far more important, what happens when a baby is born, right? In a hospital setting, most commonly, you get a flurry of activity. Unless you have somebody like there, like me there, where I'm shooing people out of the room and getting in trouble for it. But like, hey, this is a, this is a, a transformation we've just been a part of. And in that golden hour, there is some magical shit happening. Oh, yes. So if you can sit there and be present, instead of going to wrap the baby up and put the burrito on the burrito on the uh, you know on the baby on the mom's chest and get her all cleaned up there's some really important stuff that happens but it's not just in that one hour it's in the entire childhood development they've started this bond with you and as the baby emerges right we have this soul who's passing into the earth school right and all the subtle bodies and those inf- those very very um I don't know, intricate, I guess is the word, um, connections to your subtle bodies as the mom and as the dad too. I mean, there's some powerful shit happening here. As that happens, when we take a baby away, you've just been stripped from the opportunity to continue that increasingly important work as this this soul emerges, right, in in physical form. And so to go back to the C-section conversation, we have all these ideas about gentle C-section one, and I and I think that's a good I think that's a good first step. But what we what we can what we need to consider is when we have a mother crucifix style on an operating room table, and the baby emerges again just very dystopically, I think, through an abdominal incision. And that's not to say that that wasn't the path for you and and and, and Zoe. It's and an I, emergency I, intervention. Well, I mean, it, even in your birth, I, I wouldn't call it an emergency. It was just like, hey, listen, you're telling me that you don't feel like Zoe's safe in there. Let's treat this. Let's uh, on all my metrics, I feel like it's okay. But you're telling me something's happening here. Let's 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 change courses, you know. And so, um, you know, an emergency C-section. It sounds more like Mana was kind of treated like a, an emergency, where they were like, hey, there's not even time to have a conversation. We you and I had a lot of conversation. If it was a real emergency. I could have had that baby out in 30 seconds, but we didn't. We did it nice and gently. And Mana still so, has nightmares due to that. You've told me that. That's pretty interesting. Um, so, so you know, contrast the baby right on your chest experience with being in an operating room with all these bright lights and these masks that you described, this this sort of, sort of horrific emergence of a baby. And while it is important that we can do C-sections, you know, it's birthing on your terms with the the safety of modern healthcare, sort of. That's kind of my approach. Um, I, I just wonder what, how could we reimagine this experience where instead of cutting the baby and the mother off right off the bat, let's get them on the chest, let's breastfeed, let's get that baby skin to skin. Is there not a greater feeling in the world than having a brand new newborn, a naked, sticky, gooey newborn right on your chest, especially as the mother? I can't, I just can't imagine. Um, and to not interrupt that process, right? Like that's the the the, the sort of foundation that I think is lacking for all the other stuff, the, the shit we're seeing in the world, right? Like we've got these kids that are pulled away from their mothers right off the bat in order to get vitamin K injections and goop in the eyes and Stupid hepatitis shit. B injections, and it's like enough. Like we don't need to do this. And and if the and, and if we counsel appropriately, we could say, hey, there's an extremely low risk of intraventricular hemorrhage or something like that. But we're not even giving women the option to opportunity. Instead, we're just saying, hey, you're a bad mom if you don't let us stick a needle into your baby. And while I do see that some babies may benefit, so I'm gonna get a lot of criticism for this, we are again, we are reducing this to just a, you know, point A to point B medical procedure as opposed to remembering, hey, while those things might be important, is there more to this human experience? The most human experience that a woman or a father or a baby can go through to be born into the into this this plane, is there something more that we're missing? And the answer is obviously yes. <laughs> there's, there's another factor too, and that is that can you possibly imagine coming out of your mother's womb into the world, having just taken your first breath and all of a sudden, you're laying in a steel cart somewhere with flat, giant, bright lights in your eyes and people poking and prodding you. Sounds like a nightmare. Well, and then the like goop in their eyes. I'm like, the baby's trying to use their eyes for the first time and see around them, and they can't. They got They've stuff got in this, it. Yeah, and this you're haze. Like, and they can't take their hands and wipe it off because they can't control their hands yet. And they're just like, I, I'm, I'm panicked. I'm seeing this 
you know, I can't see, <laughs> you know, they don't, you know, that's just, that's. It's cruel. Mm -hmm. It's like you begin your life being tortured and segregated. <laughs> it starts off the whole, the whole adult experience where people are just these slaves to a system. They've, they've been carted along on a conveyor belt their whole life. You become a machine. Yeah. You become yeah. an object again. You know, one of the real epicenters of all this problem goes right back to the education system. Medical doctors and our entire Western education system, as you've heard me say before, does not teach you how to think. It teaches you what to think. So most doctors and therapists are recipe card users. They don't think for themselves. I used to have battles with physical therapists all the time because they would get a prescription from the doctor about what they had to do with the post-surgical shoulder or whatever. And it was dead clear to me that that prescription was not going to work based on my solid orthopedic assessment of what was wrong. And I would say to them, you're going to do that even when it goes against your own evaluation. You are the physical therapist. That's why you're there. The doctor's not a physical therapist. So they would just do what the doctors told them, but wow. the doctors don't know what the freaking hell they're doing. And I used to be in battles with them regularly. I'm saying, when are you guys going to learn to freaking think for yourself? What is the point of doing an assessment if you're not going to follow the information? I just would get irritated as hell with that mindset. I'll give you a classic freaking example of this stupidity and how deep it goes. People would get, ACL repairs because their ACL was torn or stretched out. And the therapist would be post-surgical ACL would be ultrasounding the shit out of that thing and then mobilizing it. And I'm like, do you realize that this person just got tightened because of ligamentous laxity and you were using a heat source which stretches ligaments <laughs> and you're mobilizing the ligament? you were going to take that surgical repair and turn it into another instability. And the question is, how many freaking surgeries can that person take before you wake the fuck up and learn how to use your tools? But what are they doing? Following a damn prescription, not questioning the doctor, not looking at the science. I would say to them, what the fuck did you learn in <laughs> physical therapy school? And one of my buddies said something pretty profound. We used to be an internship site at the clinic I worked at for four years for um, physical therapy rotations for, from major physical therapy schools like Ithaca, New York. And I was tasked with each new intern had to spend a part of their day with me every day. They had to do a three-month internship. So usually they'd spend like two hours and sit with me when I evaluated and learned what I did. And it would blow their minds. They're like, where did you learn all this stuff? And I said, well, the question is, why haven't you? And so one day we're in the staff area where we are, our desks are. There's 22 physical therapists and trainers there, athletic trainers. And the, the student, this guy's name was Brian, real sharp guy. He said to me in front of everybody, he goes, Paul, he goes, how is it that you know all this stuff and we don't? And my buddy, who later became my business partner in Golden Triangle Rehabilitation, a very sharp therapist named Steve Clark, he looked at him and he said, when you were in school learning how much water was displaced when you stuck your hand in a bucket, Paul was studying what really matters. That's the difference. <laughs> and that dro drove the point right home. And so um, what are the stages of childhood development and what do parents need to know in order to support those stages? Yeah, this is um, <clears throat> this is one of those topics that uh, you know I'm a new dad, and um, I've had to do some really really deep soul searching. I think I did some more deep soul searching recently with you. Um, <laughs> no surprise there. <laughs> just so you know what he's referring to, we've just done a two day healing ceremony, a very deep one with. Six of my closest friends, including Nathan, and there was a tremendous amount of deep, deep, profound emotional healing that happened. There was a lot of very, very intense emotions experienced and trauma being healed and 
a lot of other things. So that's what Nathan's talking about. Yeah, and, and I think five of the six are fathers. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, <clears throat> a lot of the things we've been talking about already today kind of lead into this this sort of framework where these little kids are just information in, information out, and we forget about the whole experience and, and what what is developing in these kids. And this kind of goes back to Steiner's work. It does go, it goes right back to Steiner's work. In fact, I actually found his work to be the only framework that I could lean into. And Kim John Payne wrote a book. I actually brought you a copy, Soul, The Soul of Discipline. She, or he, I think it's a, a male, I'm not totally sure, but uh, Masters of Education and talks about uh, the, the childhood developmental periods, which correspond exactly with Steiner's work from you know 100 years ago. But those early years, the zero to nine, I, I think that we're starting to get parenting a little bit confused. Like these little kids are still not even fully embodied. Like they're on little acid trips when they come out. Oh, hell yeah. They're <laughs> full on. They're in a roomy journey. Man. Right, right. So when parents are like, what do you, which one do you want? It's like, that's not their job. They don't have the development yet, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically to make these decisions. And this is something I've had to work with my own daughter. I had this beautiful little video that was actually circulating to me last night and the day before. My wife took it of me and me and Penelope, my daughter, and she's picking sunflowers. And I'm sitting there taking a picture with my daughter at the camera. But Penelope, my daughter, sees it as, dad is sitting here with me. And at some point she turns to me and goes, and looks directly up in my face and goes, ma, like she just wanted a kiss on the mouth. And there was a moment there where I realized that little kids are looking at us not, they're not looking at us just to like, like not even just to give them the things that they need. That's a big thing. They don't know to ask for that though. They just need you to be present, looking at them in the eyes and reconnecting with their soul. They've had this bond with you who knows how many lifetimes before. And here we are emerging. And who knows, Penny may have even been my, maybe my father reincarnate. Who knows? <laughs> I mean, we could do, that's probably a different conversation for a different time. But in those first th- zero to nine years, you are the decider and they just need to know that they're safe. Yeah. And that is such an, an important thing as parents remember. Like it's not, do you want this candy or this candy or, or do you want to watch this show or this show? Here's what we're doing. And they're going to look to you and say, okay, dada. Like, thank you for giving me that guidance. Very much in line with Steiner's work. And actually, the Waldorf education, they go on, I think, a seven to eight year cycle, right, for this purpose. Because when you reach that nine year mark, you're going to then start again. And now you're in the tweens, that nine to 13. And at this point, parents, and I'm not there yet. So you guys, you know, um, you, you, you have got an older son. Um, but He's a lot older of my, than you. Yeah, that's right. A couple <laughs> years older than me. Um, that's when we reach that gardener phase where it's like, tell me all of your ideas and I'm still going to make the decision. But we're starting to foster that conscious spirit, right? Like, I've still got you. I've still got you here. And I'm still going to keep you safe. And I need you to start trying to formulate your own ideas. This is such an important framework for me. And I even realized with Penny, she's, she's you know, only, uh, what, eight, 19 months or 18 months she just, she's like, she starts spiraling out and, and she just starts pinging. She's just like, I need somebody to ground me. And she needs me to hold her and look at her in the eye. She'll look at us. And what we do is we're like, get out of the way, Penny, or whatever else. And you realize, all you need me to do, this beautiful little girl, is to, to look at you and to connect with you in that way. She's still on that acid trip. Like, she is still trying to ground herself into this physical being. And me as a dad, all I need to do is love you through that. It takes time for the soul to actually anchor itself in the body. People don't realize that. Years. Uh, Various experts say at least three months before the soul can really inhabit the body. But if there's trauma involved, it may never come into the body fully. I've had numerous uh, patients over the years who, when I looked at them with my clairvoyance, their soul was up above their body. There was just a tail end of their, like the feet of the soul. The feet should be in the feet, right? So if you take your energy body and pull it up, so your feet are sitting in your crown. So what's happening is the body is actually going to be in a state of fear because there's nothing to really guide it, right? So now it's just a, 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 a bag of soup, a bag of chemicals, 
the consciousness has departed, which is exactly how people get diseases. Well, and, and yeah, so going back to the whole separation thing at C-section, imagine now, you know, I have a friend who's a pediatrician in LA and he's like, oh man, our daughter, we had babies around the same time. Our daughter was sleep trained, meaning she's sleeping in a room by herself without any physical contact at 12 weeks. Yeah. And, and, and I was like, wow, you know, tell me more. Like, why did you choose to? He was like, well, I knew it would work. Like, what about the actual, so I talked to Stephanie about this and she was like, I just want Penny in the bed with me. Like, I just love that. Kind. And, and for any parent who's, who's considering the co-sleeping and all that, like, we've got a king-size bed. There's no way we're rolling over onto our daughter. The, the medical system has made us afraid that every little thing that we do, SIDS and all this other stuff, like, what about the, again, again, it's not just a live baby, dead baby. What about the actual physical connection of having mom there to breastfeed at any moment? Or, I mean, gosh, if, if you've never woken up with a baby between you and the person you love, your beloved, my wife, Stephanie, who's my rock, to wake up with our daughter between us was just the most important, most grounding thing. And I think that Penny benefited so greatly from that. But of course, we don't measure those metrics. It's just like, hey, back is best or blah, 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 blah. That's all, that's all important. I'm not saying we discard that stuff. But again, we're forgetting that we are not just pooping and peeing and eating machines. <laughs> we are, this little soul needs me. <laughs> yeah, I always say to people, it's like, you know, if you think about millions of years ago, whatever, you know, thousands of years ago, and if we were living in caves, would you have a baby and then put the baby in another cave? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's just like, no, instinctually you'd say, I want to keep this next to me and protect it, you know? But we're like, oh, we got a big house. It's fine. We can just close the door right. and it's We've safe. got our security system and, it's and fine our fire alarms. <laughs> but I'm like, yeah. but what else is that baby needing? That's, you know, security of your touch, your heat, your body, your, your sense, your breath, all those things that the baby connects to to feel safe. And we're like... Oh, you're fine. You're in this room with a warm blanket. It's like, well, that's not you all know, it needs. There's another underlying factor, and I know you'll both agree with me. It's lazy parenting. They're trying, a lot of people are trying to negate the responsibility. They want to watch TV or they want to read books or whatever, drink their alcohol, but they don't want to actually interact with the child and take the responsibility of new life. It's, it's, uh, it would be kind of like, um, buying a dog and then just watering it whenever you have time, maybe once a week or when you're not busy and wondering why your dog dies in a couple of weeks. You know, it's, you know, one of the transitions that's really critical is that when you become a parent, you need to have the energy and the resources within yourself to make a long string of sacrifices there is no I and we. And if a parent is not mature enough to go from we from I to we from I, then you actually have this massive disconnect and that makes the child an object again. Now you've just got a parakeet in a cage or something. You don't have a child. And that's devastating to the psychology of a child for its life. It's, it's bad news. And there's, you know, you, then you start getting into all this absolutely ridiculously dumb stuff with women being chastised for breastfeeding in public and being told not to breastfeed. You know, one of the things that <laughs> upset me deeply was I read a, a, a research paper in, in one of my books um, talking about how Gerber baby, baby food went to Guatemala. They were trying to, you know, spread their baby food all over the world. But Guatemala had already learned from the use of uh, formula and, and, and corporate-made baby foods that the children were getting sick and the mothers didn't do as well, and it was disrupting the bonding with the child. So they passed a law that they would not use, wow. and that they inspired and educated women on breastfeeding. Gerber came in and sued the Guatemalan government and beat them in court to force them to drop that so they could sell Gerber baby food and put all these mothers on this soya-based horse shit and sold that, but forced the government to not protect the women's health and the children's health. That is the kind of corporate evil 
that is rampant in the medical system, and it's why we have big problems with corporations today. They have more power than governments, and it's dangerous as shit. And we have got to get corporations out of government. We have to get them out of politics, and we got to get religion out of government and politics, or we are going to be in deeper and deeper trouble. Deep shit. Yeah. I heard that was like done in Africa, too, where there were mothers were breastfeeding and they were telling them and educating them that their breast milk wasn't as good and this formula was more superior. Such so bullshit. here are these women who didn't have a lot of money and they were spending little money they made to buy formula to feed the child because they were told it was better. And it's like- Money we, they don't have Money otherwise. they don't yeah. have. And they were doing that because they were trying to do the best for their child and they were being told that that was the best thing they could do. I'm like, are you kidding me? I remember I, I used to work in Malawi for three or four summers. I was there in, in college, which is a little sliver of a country in East Africa. And I remember while we were there, UNICEF had this campaign to get everybody um, breast milk. Because I'm sorry, not breast milk. Uh, formula. Formula, yeah. Um, because they were concerned about transmission of HIV, you know, and this and that. And, you know, perhaps. But again, this is not just food going into a baby. This is an important bonding experience, not, not to mention support of the, the gut health and everything else. You know, when you look at the list of ingredients on formula, we did use some formula um, uh, for Penelope, but when you look at the list of, of ingredients, it is just a bunch of processed junk. It doesn't matter if it's the most expensive organic stuff on the shelf, which by the way, is all behind um, lock and key in most stores because women who are otherwise overworked and they haven't been supported in the breastfeeding process go to the store and they feel desperate. They want to steal, you know, formula. So they lock it all up. Like like condoms and 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 breast milk are the two things that or I'm sorry, um, formula are the two things we lock up and those are the two things that make, you know, the most sense maybe for some of these these moms. But um, I remember when we when when I was in uh in Malawi women were just not taking it. They weren't using the formula. They were like, this is crap. I'm not, I'm not using this stuff. Good. It's, it's, it's made of soy and corn and all this other stuff. High fructose corn syrup. Yeah. Oh like my gosh. Really modified yeah. crap. Yeah. yeah. Not Bill to mention Gates shit. Uh, vitamins and things based on the RDAs that you talked about. Like who knows what this baby needs? You know, the baby needs what you are giving him, g- giving them by, by breast. For anybody out there who's Who's kind of you know? There's a lot of reasons why women can't breastfeed. So I also am, am, am not I'm not um, discarding that altogether. But if uh, Tom Cowan and Sally Fallon wrote a book, the the baby book, it's a nourishing traditions book, and there's in there a recipe that has a natural formula you can make using raw dairy and some lipids and some other stuff you you kind of put in there in order to better represent what a baby should have if. You you're in a position it. where you really aren't able to produce. And there are there are people who really do need a, a better alternative, but this formula stuff is just a just a racket. <laughs> yeah, another one. Yeah, another one. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them though is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come. And they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P A L E O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn's Superfood Bars. You, you talked about the stages of childhood development, but you didn't tell us the stages. Could you elaborate on that? I, I go through like the, the, the terms that I use are the gardener, I'm sorry, the governor, the gardener and the guide. But I, I have a feeling you want to elaborate a little bit more from Steiner's philosophy as to how 
Is, is that what you're thinking? Well, I'm asking just because we're talking about stages, but they weren't stated. So I don't think people listening would really know what we're talking about. Yeah. So I, I think that I think that what I'm learning through this process, and granted, I'm still learning, but I hadn't found a lot of good parenting advice. In fact, I told Stephanie, I said, where are the like childhood philosophers? Just like I consider myself a medical philosopher. We're going to talk about fevers in a minute. That's a, a bit of a ph- philosophy there, paradigm shift altogether. But I think that when I was trying to figure out how can I be a better dad, I wasn't finding anything that wasn't just this reductionist view of information in, information out. So this is kind of based on the, uh, I think, the the integration of the subtler, subtler bodies, the etheric bodies, the astral bodies, et cetera, as a child is going through those uh, those stages. And the way that I have it broken down is zero to nine years is that kind of, that that sort of it let's embody this child the in the physical phase. space. That's the the the, gar- the governor. Governor, okay. So that means I'm I'm in control. Oh, I get it. Where, yes. where, where you need to be protected. Okay. And yes. you need to be loved and seen. And then we move on to the gardener stage where it's just like, oh, I'm nourishing your ideas and I'm still keeping you safe. And then we move on to the guide, which is, hey, tell me your ideas. And unless you're going to totally murder yourself, I'm going to let you kind of do that and still kind of hold space for that. And I feel that 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 those three stages of development, which are manifest, you know, w- within the Waldorf education program, I think that they're so beautiful. I think that they're so simple, but they also give us a job as parents to be actively engaged and present, and not just always putting them in front of the TV. So that, like, I think what you were referring to before, Paul, is um, it's it's like if, if I'm going to be present with you, then I have to give up a part of me. And I struggled with that with Penelope. I think I'm still struggling with that now. I, I think our work together has actually been really helpful these past couple of days, but I didn't realize that I was struggling with it. Oh my gosh, I used to have this, 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 uh, this, uh, my life experience was mine alone. Mm, and compartmentalized. Then to, yeah. Then I had to cut it in half and now I'm actually cutting it further. And that doesn't mean that I'm giving a part of myself away. I'm realizing it's opening the space for even more abundance of love and compassion and that's the greatest gift to being a parent. Yeah, you got to be porous. You've got to be the the energy of relationship has to be able to flow in. But you know, as a medical doctor, you're trained to really encapsulate yourself to keep yourself separate from people's emotions, separate from their lives and separate from their needs because they say, "Oh, you can't be objective." I mean, I've heard many lectures where Dr. Daniel Siegel, you know who that is? Yeah, yeah. saying he almost got kicked out of medical school multiple times because he had a genuine interest in what was going on in people's lives. And his... <laughs> it sounds like my, my whole training. <laughs> his teachers kept saying, if you keep talking to people like that, we're going to kick you out of medical school. You can't do that here. You cannot do that. You're, it's going to take too much time. You're going to be overwhelmed by what's going on in their life. And it's not what we do. And he says, like, how can I do medicine without engaging in the person's life? You know, and they just about blackballed him. Yeah, we talked last time about the importance of telling our birth stories. Like the process of giving birth is a traumatic experience. It's not a bad thing. It's a traumatic experience. Trauma is not always a bad thing. Um, in fact, trauma is really how we grow. We need these traumas. We need to then integrate those traumas. And Sports we need to... is nothing but a series of traumas. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you're pushing yourself. Exactly. Right. Right. And so you know the 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 pregnancy and the childbirth experience is a trauma. And that's okay that we acknowledge that. And part of why I think you and I got along so well when I first met you is like, tell me your story. And we, we, I know we went into this last time, but that connection is not something that's incentivized for doctors. And we spent an hour just getting to know who you were. And then I was like, okay, these people are a little different than most of my <laughs> patients. Um, uh, but, you know, without having known, um, without getting, really getting to know you and getting to know your dog, I knew about Maggie before that even happened, right? Like you told me, like, I've got this dog at home and that actually helps inform me as to who you are. And without knowing who you are, I can't be your therapist or your physician or whatever else. I mean, um, and, you know, we need to start doing that better in, in medical school. It's not just go down the checklist of review of systems, right? Like, are you having headaches or fever or double vision or blah, 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 blah. That's important too. But what about you? You're not the sum of your parts. You are a, a conscious human being. And I'm here to serve you. And without you seeing me, right, and us reflecting back on one another, this isn't going to tango. No. 
It's not. Have you ever by chance read or uh, explored the book The Biology of Transcendence by Joseph Chilton Pierce? No, but that's a book that you recommended to me last yeah. time I saw you. I'm mentioning it because it has a very beautifully laid out um, set of stages of childhood development in a, in a, based on how the nervous system and the brain grows and develops. So you can see what's happening at each stage. And <laughs> if you understand Steiner's model, we basically completely and utterly destroy kids by exposing them to math and reading before the age of seven to 10 because it yeah. pushes them into their left brain. Well, they say that when a baby's born, I think it's delta, then theta, then alpha, then beta. And so the delta, that's our dream state. And so they're in a dream state till about 18 months to two years. And so they're just, you know, just going through the motions, cause and effect, feel, this, that. And it's not till about two that they go into theta. And that theta stage is usually till about age five. And so that age, kids can talk, but they can't really remember. Mm. They're living in the moment. So when you tell your, ask your three-year-old, what'd you do at school today? If they go to preschool or something, they go, I don't know. And they, what do you mean you don't know? Because they don't. And if you keep on asking them, then they're going to force that they need to do this. And so they forces them into their alpha state because they're like, mommy needs to know what I did. And they're trying to remember. Wow. And that's not good for them. You want to just allow them to be. And if they remember something or they sing a song, you're like, oh, they learned that from school. But to ask them forces them to try to do things that they're not they're not capable of doing and just like mathematics and you know teaching them to read and write you know mothers brag oh my kids only three and reads but what did you take away from the child you forced them into alpha to be able to do that and so now that creative center that they're in is now being damaged so they're they're now learning how to that makes you know, so much sense switch into their left brain when they should be still in their right brain and, and the then, narrative is in the left brain hemisphere yeah, narrative yeah. function is left brain and so that keeps them concrete and so that kind of sets them up for a job that's in a cubicle and doing what they're told instead of exploring and being creative and so the whole Steiner education is about keeping your child to the first 5 years in role playing and creativeness and and learning how to make you know sticks just play. And play just play just play I mean we've and forgotten not, how to play and not teach them to read and write and do all these things that they'll they'll learn but their brains will be ready at about six or seven you know and then they're gonna take that on and when they can and have space for it but otherwise you're just actually causing more damage than good over time and it's like wait. And then we don't wonder why we can't think. Well, because we weren't told to think. We were told what to do, you know. And so that's part of the damage. I don't know if you knew this, but my wife and I used to teach in Korea before medical school. Oh, right. We were teachers in Korea. And in Korea, the education system there is fucking brutal. <laughs> I bet. From a very, very early age, you're not only going to just, and we're talking like kindergarten. You're not just going to eight hours of school. You go to what's called Hagwon, or it's a, an academy program afterwards in order to further reinforce the things that you were have been learning in school. So, it's an indoctrination person. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And these kids, yes, are good at performing well in tests, but you then give them a, a, a piece of paper and you say, hey. Draw me a picture. Draw me a picture. And they're like. Freak out. Well, what, what do I have to draw? Like, just draw anything. Mm -hmm. uh, Show me the picture I need to draw and I'll copy it. Exactly. And they'll do it perfectly. Yes. But but that's not the they exercise. <laughs> yeah. So so what I, what I uh, you know, I'm thoughtful about this with Penelope Luce what do I want her to do right now? Do I need her to be learning? Do I need her to know the alphabet and counting and all that stuff? Like, that would be fun if we can count together. But like, I don't need you to know this stuff in order to advance you to the next level. During these initial years when we are developing the brain, um, obviously way before their decision-making capacities, but just what does a child need to, 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 to thrive? I need you to play and I'll keep you safe while you're playing. And you just explore. And, and that could mean a little bit of screen time here and there. It could be building with blocks. It could be just like, let's, let's get you in the bathtub and like let you just play. We don't need to have this regimented procedure. But since we've been popped into that program, we don't see that as, as very easy to implement for our children. So, you know, it's a learning process, I think, for all of us, um, just because of how dysfunctional our education system is. But I am happy that there are are programs like like Waldorf out there that really do appreciate that there's a different way to do this. And yes, they may not read until age six. That's okay. That's I told okay. my mom ahead of time, I was like, if my kids aren't reading by age six, are you okay? And she was like, oh yeah, totally, whatever you want to do. But I, I just needed to make sure that I had that like support from her. <laughs> well, I know because mothers can be the worst. You know, oh, yeah. I remember the stress of Mana when he was two and she's like, you need to have him potty trained now. He's yeah. two. I'm like, what do you mean? Well, he's two. He has to be potty trained. And so then that thought was like, okay, I'm doing something wrong as a mother. You mean so, your mother? 
Mm-hmm. My mom. Ma, your mom was. My tough. mom was telling me that I need to have Mana potty trained, and wow. so that stress. I was like, oh, maybe I should. So I really got on this kick about potty training Mana, and it caused this stress between me and Mana. And I realized, what am I doing here? I'm like, I'm creating a wedge, not creating further bonding, because now I'm like getting mad at him because he's not going to the bathroom because he should be doing this. And then I'm like, so as soon as I went, <sighs> That's such great advice. And so as soon as I stepped back and said, you know what? When he's ready. Why does he need to be potty trained at two? If his, he's not ready to do this, he's not going to be five years old, not you know going to the bathroom. You know, at that point, we'd have to get some help. But at two, we're forcing these restrict, you know, this demands on him. And so, as soon as I pushed, let, pushed back and said, you know what, when you're ready, Mana, then all of a sudden he told me when he was ready and it was easy and it was like i look mommy i went potty in the toilet and i'm like oh good you know and so it was so much healthier and i thought i don't need to push these demands that just breaks the bond between your child and you because your child now thinks he's not making mommy happy in some way and it says i I, mommy doesn't love me or mommy i'm not good enough for mommy and they push you away and i'm like i don't want that so with zoe it's always been she was like 18 months she was like i want to be potty trained like she didn't say that but she was like potty potty and she started doing and i'm great and i remember she says no diaper and so she wanted to try uh, pull up so i said Give, so i bought her some and she and then she was using the bathroom and then i remember one day she looked at me like this was two days of trying to pee on the toilet and she was like only you know not even two years old and she looked at me and she had wet her pull-ups and she's like no no more mommy diaper and she's like put the diaper on me and it was like she was stressed and I said oh it's okay I put the diaper on she was happy and then she didn't want to do the potty thing for like two three four weeks went by and then all of a sudden she was like pull up mommy like I'm ready now but I think the stress of I want to play and I want to do these things and now I have to think of my biological system it was just too much and she was like I'm stressed and They're I can not ready see that. that. Yeah. And I'm like, and so now here she is a little over two and she's back wanting to train. So now she's like, I, I'm doing it. So this morning she got up, she went pee by herself. Look, mommy. And she claps her hands. <laughs> oh, that's very good. You know, and it's the greatest joy. And so I find that it's now exciting for her when she does it, but there's no stress if she doesn't do it, you know? And I, I so she's like, I love you no matter what. And we'll get this. And you see Mana peeing on the toilet. You see mommy doing this and we're all doing this, but when you're ready, and that's such a healthier feeling with it because there's not that need to impress anybody that like, my daughter's two years old. She's fully potty trained. So for what? For what? So the Those world can tell me like, she's awesome? So you fit, fit you into a box. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, an expectation by somebody else. Right. God. And I find it's Set just so for... much healthier, you know? And so the same thing with everything. It's like, why do we force and scream and yell our kid can't read and write? It's like, well, what else? What, he can do some other great things right now. Let's focus on the things that he's doing well instead of saying what he can't do. You know, it's kind of like that cartoon we see with, you know, all the animals from the you know kingdom are sitting above a tree and says, okay, who's the smartest animal? Who can climb the tree the fastest? Well, some animals can climb much faster and some can't climb at all. And right. it's like, <laughs> how do we tell that, that's, that some of these animals are dumb because they can't climb a tree? You know, and I think that's, you know, looking at our children as gifts and that's saying, what metaphor. are they good at? And let's focus on those and let's not stress them out of the things they can't do well. And it comes a time when we might need to give them a little nudge, but not pushing on and forcing and saying, gosh, you're two years old. Stop. You have to do this this way. You have to fit into the box. You have to do it. Otherwise, everybody's going to think I'm a bad mother. It's like, "Mm." and then, and then all the stuff we've been talking about with the medical system, right? How many, you know, even doctors, like how many doctors are painting ever? Like I'm painting now because of, you know, our relationship. And I can't tell you even just covering a canvas with a beautiful color. You don't have to even do anything more. Just applying color to your life. Like that's not that's not a part of what what you're supposed to do as an adult or whatever else you know like that's what society tells us you need to be productive you need to be you know achieving the next thing what about just sitting back and enjoying the experience of coloring mm-hmm. but, but we knock that out of you when you were two mm-hmm. so it's no so it's no surprise that we've got all these these you know high level executives and everything else that are depressed they're disconnected they have these crappy relationships they've got these you know crappy relationships with their with their partners with their kids they're on their fourth wife and they just can't seem to get figured out and it's like is there not a piece of you that is not just you know f- shitting pissing and eating and going on to the next task is there no space here just to like to be to be yeah, and I always to have tell people fun and to play. we're human beings, not human doings. Oh, I love that. We're all yeah. caught up in the doing. You know, Steiner also warned in his teachings that most parents should not play with their children until they learn to play. And what he was pointing out is that most people are so outcome oriented, left brain, that they get frustrated with kids if they don't 
put the truck together right or build the castle right or they're critiquing and judging. <laughs> so it pushes the kid into a stressful experience of play. So Steiner said, until parents actually learn how to play as a child with a child, they should avoid playing with their children and leave it to professionals like Steiner school teachers and people that know how to interact with children. And when, you know, Angie hired a Steiner teacher to come work at the house, it was amazing to see how differently the kids responded to a skilled Steiner teacher. It was amazing. You know, there was no screaming, yelling, nothing. Why isn't, you know, Mana running away from the nanny? It was kind of like, Mana wanted to participate because he was encouraged and it was a loving environment and he was excited and she had ways of saying things that were supportive instead of negating the child, you know, and so if the child wanted to do something else, they would sing a song and that would invite them back in. Wash hands, you know, and they're like, I want to wash my hands, and, you know, and then, oh, we're going to sit down now. And if Mana wanted to do something else, she goes, oh, Mana, we can do that later. But right now we're going to do this. And he got it like, okay, it's not that I can't do this. I'm just, I'm supposed, I'm going to do this now. And look, we're all sitting here. And, oh, I can do this instead of saying, don't do that, you know, and screaming. So it was such a beautiful energy on the children. And it's like, there was that, you know, it was just working with, you know, harmony and working, you know, just, and you have, you know, just, you you have things, it's not rigid, but there's a structure to it. So the child feels safe. We first play and then we wash hands, we have a snack and then we go out inside and then we play and then we wash our hands, we have lunch. And so there's a rhythm. So the rhythm is what they're teaching the child is how to develop a healthy rhythm and balancing the body with nourishment and play indoor, outdoor. And that was so, it's so beautiful. And that's so much nicer than, you know, running around screaming and and yelling at a child, telling it has to do this and that. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combined them without any weird excipients or, you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by Optimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it? And what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living40 and put in your coupon code Paul10 and you get a 10% discount, and of course, everything has a 100% money-back guarantee. You can't get better than that. And for a limited time, Bioptimizers is also giving away free bottles of their best-selling products, P3OM and Masszymes, with select purchases. Enjoy. Well, just because we're running short on time here, let's hit this last question. Fever. What is the function of fevers in children and the consequences of drugging children to try to suppress a fever? Great question. I, um, this is also from the anthroposophical approach. There's, um, so you guys have all seen, you know, the little kids, they get these high fevers. What are these high fevers? Immune adjustments. Yeah, there's something happening there. And I don't know if we necessarily really understand it. You know, what we what we presume is there's there's two models. One is I had some notes here. Here we go. Um, one model is right that there's a bunch of infection in there, right? And part of the the heating process helps fight that infection. I think that's completely legitimate. And um, and then I also I have kind of gone a, a step further and I've, I've wondered this and I actually found some answers in anthroposophical medicine, which I found pretty fascinating. And that is that, hmm, like, what's the purpose of this fever? Is there some reason that I'm, I'm receiving this, this heat? Is this heat a reflection of some greater leveling up? Is it a spiritual, emotional, psychological leveling up? And when we look at our little kids, I can't tell you how many times Penny, you know, 
our, our 18 month old has gone to bed with a, you know, she's like 101 fever and she feels like shit. She's got snots and she's just like, Oh, it just wants to lay with you. And, and, um, and we're tempted to give some Tylenol to bring that down. Well, yeah, if it's a really high fever, yes, you should be bringing that, ty- that fever down, but should we be a, a eliminating it altogether? Are we, are we, um, um, inhibiting that spiritual upgrade? Because what, what happens is the next day she wakes up, if we haven't treated it fully, and she's like saying new words. Like there's something that has changed there. She looks at you differently. She moves differently. She's got better balance. And so I just tend to wonder about that a little bit, even as adults, right? And, and the viral thing has really got me, got me thinking about this. You know, like are we receiving some information from the outside? And are, is our system going through a reboot? You know, are we getting some more information from the outside in the form of a viral envelope, you know, with some new information perfectly encoded in some nucleic acid we're integrating that and the system gets a little sluggish, just like when we up- update our computers. You have to reboot it and then it, it wakes up and yeah, you're feeling better than ever, right? Like now if the if the the hardware is unable to accommodate that, then you might get sick and you might even die, right? Like you can't put the most recent Mac OS, you know, the operating system on your old MacBook. It doesn't work like that. So I think about this a lot. And, and within the anthroposophical approach, what, what you have to ask is, is the heat of this fever emanating off or is it internalized? And I've actually done some eurythmic um, massage and whatnot when they're in, in the, the therapist is a good friend of mine. Her name's Sabrina. And she had said, you know, I was expecting there to be some heat in your kidneys and I didn't find that. So I went looking and it turns out you're in really, really good shape. You might just have a little like a little something here is being upgraded, you know? And and so the way that the anthroposophical approach, I think, would would um, would view this, and I've done this with a couple patients already, the, if you can sense that the heat is emanating, and you know how that feels, right? You can feel it's just, it's like, I am hot, I got to get my clothes off, etc. cetera. The belladonna compresses can bring that fever down just very, very gently. Um, and if it's internalized, aconitum a, a, a is another um, anthroposophic uh, treatment that we can use in order to bring that heat down as well. But those in addition, homeopathics as well. Yeah, yeah well, those are technical. Those are I mean, homeopathics. Those are homeo- yeah. homeopathics. Yeah, and and homeopath homeopathy is a big part of uh, of anthroposophical medicine. But then, in addition, just resting and hydrating and, and meditating on this, you know. And when I think about our kids. What Penny needs is for me to just be there and be present with her. And I can't be doing all this other stuff. She needs me to, it's back to the sunflower thing. She needs me to, me to be looking at her and seeing her and being present with her and holding space for this upgrade that's happening. And you know it. You know that that's what's happening. Um, and then on the other hand, right, if, you're, if your kid has 104 fever, you don't want them to go into seizures and all that stuff. So, so that, that can be pretty, pretty costly. Um, and there may be a, ma- a massive infection. So I'm not saying every fever, you know, should yeah. be supported. And monitored, but, monitored. And, you know, like I said, if it's not lower than 102, then allow it to be and allow the allow child to, to go through it. Like uh, Zoe will get a little bit of a fever and the next day morning her teeth will pop out. That's right. Well, the, the teething is a big one. Yeah, we forget and so about that. Well, you know, that's so a lot of times she'll have a runny nose and a fever and you think she's catching a cold and the next day a tooth is there and there's no fever, and there's no runny nose. So it's the body's immune response reaction to some stress or change in the body. So it can happen with gross spurts, like you said, learning new vocabulary. The body has to stretch itself to learn and that requires sometimes heat. And I mean, you're adding heat into, you're, you're, you're heating the system or you're taking heat off of the system as this, you know, we have to keep the, 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 the laws of thermodynamics in, in play. If you want to make this scientific, I think it's also a spiritual thing. And, um, again, I guess this is another example of how, if we just took a step back and let's think about how does our paradigm of, of fever, I mean, I used, I chose fever. I could have chosen a bunch of things, but how is our management of fever impacting our ability to really engage with our patients. If you're just going to wipe out the fever, that's easy. Take Tylenol, like big deal. But what are you inhibiting by taking that fever away altogether? Well, it's negating the wisdom of the body. It's, it's, it's using an external idea and imposing it on a complex system that, uh, again, has more wisdom. I think the real question should be, is the person in danger or is right. it a natural that's process? That's exactly right. You know, we, we have this tendency to drug any discomfort for our children or for ourselves, but we abort the natural process of healing. The other thing is kids are growing their microbiome. So the immune system is very carefully monitoring what's coming in the gut. And, you know, 
we're so used to eating, we don't think about it. But a lot of what a kid eats is brand new to its body. You know, it starts eating beef. It's got a completely different set of genes coming in there. Then it's eating chicken. Then it's eating fish or a banana or whatever. So the body's monitoring, trying to put together a symbiosis of of uh, genetics that support its own unique biological needs. So it's like a you know, if we if we don't want weeds in our garden, we got to go pull them out, right? So the body has to go through and start extracting and, and uh, adjusting to, to bring this thing into what will support its own life because of its unique internal physiology, biochemistry, and uh, soul nature. So I think a lot of people forget that the entire body is a living yeah. system. It's a, it's a dynamic, you know, the body's like a river. You cannot stand in the same river twice. It's impossible. So we keep expecting the body to be this rigid, reliable structure. And that's where all these damn data sets get in trouble because you're actually trying to crystallize the body. But it's not. I mean, you're going through a divorce and you've got a whole different set of internal dynamics. You lose a job. Someone dies in your family. Or, you know, like for me, when my brother committed suicide, you could just say I had a fever for about four years. I was having a hard time processing that. And it, it lit me up like a Christmas tree on many levels. It uh, brought me right to the edge of depression and deep, painful sadness. So the point is someone doing physiological assessments on me, maybe my cortisol levels, might have easily said, oh, you have high cortisol, you need cordyceps or some stupid thing, without asking me what's going on in your life. Well, my brother killed himself. Well, that would make a huge difference if a doctor knew that, at least if he had any wit about him you know, or her. What a, what a fantastic journey again. Um, very, very important topics. And thank you, honey, for your contributions. I always love your wisdom. I married a smart, very smart woman. Yes, you did. <laughs> thank you. And you're very cute too. <laughs> Nathan, you're almost as cute. I'm almost as cute. <laughs> I'm a step down from Angie. But. Well, at least for a guy <laughs> with heterosexual orientation. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> Where can people find you for support from you and what are you offering just so people know what they can, you know, get out of you or with you or uh, how would you like to, to help people make the next step if they want your help? Yeah, just go to belovedholistics.com. Um, I'll, I'll give Penny the link. And um, there is a special promo for your, for your listeners, 50 bucks off the, the consultation. It's usually $350. It can be up to two hours. Um, so I generally charge $300 for, for your listeners because um, just to, as a just sort of incentive. A de- incentive, but also just gratitude for, for the types of people that, that you know, that that you attract. I mean, it's also not everybody's ready for this type of process. So no, because it requires you to actually think and participate in your own life. <laughs> exactly. What yeah. a concept. Yep. And I also sell time banks. So that's actually the preferred way because most of the things that I'm doing with it, whether it's in maternity care or it's fixing some chronic issue, it's going to take some time. So this is not a one and done. This is not your typical, hey, go to the PCP and get the script for steroids or whatever else. So there, there takes a little bit of time. But we go deep. I mean, we're going to go through every system. And when I find a dead end, I get some help and we will get you fixed up. So. Awesome. So if I want to buy some time to live a little longer, can I buy some time from you? You can. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of a time bank before. That was yeah. a cool concept. More of like a subs- subscription fee. And I prioritize those clients um, because I know that they're really in it to, to, to do some, some deep work. So mm-hmm. Great. Cool. Yeah. Oh, and one other thing. I actually just uh, launched a collaborator program. So any coach, doctor, whoever, midwife, anybody out there who, who wants to collaborate with me, I get a lot of requests for that. Like, hey, can I help review this patient with you? I'm doing that now at 100 bucks a month, 99 bucks a month. Um, and, and that price will probably go up later. But I'm going to take, take a group of people that want to just have an ongoing, you can Open reach out anytime, yeah. anytime, email, call, whatever, and we will work together. I learn as much from people, um, from other other therapists and, and physicians and midwives as they learn from me. Um, so but, it sounds like it's consulting. How do you how do you correlate collaboration with consultation? 
So consulting is really, I, I mean, so clients, patients, um, whoever, they can actually bring me on as, as their, their doctor. I will be your doctor. From that side, I guess it would be more of a consultation thing like, hey, hey, Angie, can I run this thing? Or, or Angie, do you want to run something by me? And you can write me an email, shoot me a phone call Ask or whatever. questions, general exactly, advice. Exactly, yeah. You know, um, kind of like being on call. but Yeah, through, I'm, through, I'm your pocket doc. Through an easy <laughs> uh, mechanism that's not stressful for, for you or them. Sure, and I think it's just as beneficial for, for all of your coaches and your staff yes. as well uh, I think to have a doctor that you can run things by. I, I think it's really um, what's missing in medicine. Yeah, right. I want to collaborate. I want to, I want to be able to engage in your patients and I know I don't have the answers so let's work together um, and it's a it's a 99 per month uh, sort of deal so it reminds me of the Chinese ancient Chinese model where the doctor did not get paid if you got sick he only got paid when you were doing well huh. mm-hmm. I don't that's, know if you're aware of that <laughs> yeah. no that's freaking great mm-hmm. yeah that's, freaking great. that's how the they world used would to be do like- it I'll take th- I'll take that deal my my clients and patients get better so <laughs> Well, fantastic journey, you guys. I hope you enjoyed this very important podcast. Hope you agree with us that we need to all work together to start really being conscious of questioning and not putting money into medical approaches, government approaches, corporate approaches, technology approaches that are dangerous for our health, vitality, our connection to ourself, our connection to each other, and our connection to the world. Um we have to do this ourselves. The people that have put these large organizations together are heavily invested in keeping things the way they are because it's multi-billion dollar and trillion dollar adventures. And these people don't actually use humanism to motivate their life. They use capitalism and bottom line. And it's all decisions about how do we make the board as much money as possible and how do CEOs get as rich as possible Uh, without any really concern for the fact that it may or may not be effective or could be damaging our our world culture. Um, And so if we don't do this ourselves through education, which is what this podcast is all about, nothing's going to change. It's going to get worse. Um, And, you know, we're at the point now where we can't get much sicker as a society. Who's left? I mean, the degree of illness in children and down syndrome and vaccine injuries and drug injuries and overdoses. I mean, we're getting to the point where we are um, as close to a handicapped society or culture as you can get. And, And how do you maintain an economy when a huge percentage of your population is handicapped at some significant level? Can't eat right, don't drink water, don't eat real food, don't move their bodies, don't have a relationship with their bodies, are doing fad dieting, plastic surgery to try to take shortcuts, don't want to go through the birthing process. I mean, this this is really the disease of technocracy. It's a very, very dangerous takeover of, of scientocracy and technocracy. And the paradox of it is it goes completely and utterly against the principles of science, which is just a clusterfuck from hell. Yeah, and I I want to I want to add on to that a little, Paul. I, you and Angie and and your um your training programs, you're producing people that are more scientific than many of the people in the medical community, and that is asking questions and trying to find new solutions. That that in and of itself is the scientific process. And I want to honor both of you and acknowledge both of you just for doing the real work. You guys have done your homework. I mean, you guys have really, really built something special, and I, I really feel like the world is uh, owes you a debt of gratitude for well, putting these programs together. I'll tell you one thing: my birthday did. <laughs> it really gave me some wind in my sails because I haven't even begun to open all the gifts, and some of the letters were just heart busting open. I mean, I just we started last night with some of the gifts and some of the letters. And I, I'll tell you what, I was just crying. It was so intense to feel all the gratitude come back and letters from people. Angie read me a couple of letters from people whose lives were completely transformed from my teachings and. And social media too. There was just beautiful messages. Such a pouring out, out of love. Yeah. Pictures from. Paul I'm glad from it's coming back, back to you. Because I've got 50 text lovely messages people. on my phone that came in yesterday <laughs> while we were in ceremony. Just people saying thank you. And um, 
you know, the, the closing thing I'll say is that Angie and I have done our homework, but we do our homework every day. We didn't stop doing homework. Every client, every situation, you know, that's what my library's for. Angie's got loads of books herself. She studies all the time. Penny's involved in researching stuff for the kids and helping. Um, you know, every day for us is an adventure. We don't know what the hell's coming. You don't know what your kid's going to get into or, you know, you you have to be, you have to have the energy to parent because parenting is a very dynamic process that can be brutally demanding. And so if we don't take good care of ourselves and have an open mind, uh, we get into a double bind. We don't have enough energy to parent and we don't have enough energy to learn. And, you know, there's an old saying that I created. If you, um, if you can't learn, you can't grow. And if you can't grow, you can't learn. You know, learning is growing and growing is learning. If you stop learning, you stop growing. And if you stop growing, you stop learning. So it's a self-reinforcing process, but life has to be seen as an adventure, not an outcome. You know, when people keep thinking outcome-oriented, if I just get to this, I'll be able to retire and I won't have to worry about money anymore. The infinite so game. You're, you're futurizing yourself. So you, you get so focused on putting money in the bank or getting your kids to some college, you forget to live every day. That's right. And so it, it leads to a, a family crisis, a health crisis. And, and so, you know, we're, we're at a time in the evolution of human beings where we're walking on very thin ice on many, many levels from environment to society to government to politics to religion uh, the list is so long it's just, it's just a freaking miracle just the environment we haven't even touched on the environment mm -hmm. that's yeah. like the only thing that's more important than people to me is this planet is going to fall apart unless it is we, falling apart it's that'll scares be our, the our shit next out podcast of me. Jeez, <laughs> i have been working on this for my whole career i was lecturing on this stuff 25 years ago warning people we were on on the edge of death and people just look at me like I'm some kind of like hippie, weirdo, futurist or whatever. I'm like, you guys need to pay attention. I'm quoting solid scientific research here. This is not me just being an extremist. It's me saying, uh, look, if you're if you got to drive to an appointment that's 50 miles away and you got one gallon of gas in your car, you don't just ignore it. You got to pull over and get fuel. Well, we're running out of resources. We're on empty, but we're consuming at a greater rate <laughs> than we've ever consumed in the history of man, all in the name of capitalism. Accelerating towards the and edge. consumerism. We are sucking more life out of nature every day than she can regenerate in months, right? And People need to wake up to that. Yeah. I mean, that's... We have got to get back into harmony with nature or we're going to freaking die and it ain't going to be pretty. And all of the stuff we've talked about today, I mean, this is all a complete disconnection from uh, our nature. It is. As, as a part of the biosphere. And if we destroy our biosphere, we destroy ourselves. It's, nature is our nature. I mean, we are nature. And the problem is, is we have minds that convince us otherwise. And that's what I call living in your head. Once you start living in your head, you, you basically disconnect your head from your body. And so you start getting into isms and ideas that are more powerful than reality. And that's when you're, that's when you're, um, that's when you're inviting the, the dark angel to come sign your death warrant for you. Say goodbye. Uh -oh. And, uh, you know, the thing is we're torturing the lives of billions and trillions of other creatures out there that deserve a life because they live to support all of nature and we keep poisoning them and gassing them and you know torturing them and chemicalizing them and ruining the rivers ruining the oceans ruining the sky filling the sky with aluminum and chalk dust to life assets. cool the planet down <laughs> instead of actually saying hey wait why don't we just switch to free energy sources clean energy sources and i mean the list just goes on uh you know so we need a lot of young intelligent people who can learn how to engage nature and how to use science productively and we got to inspire these people to get out there and and express their genius because the people that are 
at adult age, most of them are too washed up and too brainwashed and too closed in to to give a shit. They're like um, Pavlov's dog. They're trapped. You know, what a great journey. Thank you very much. I love you both. Love you Thank too. you guys Thanks, for love you. joining us today. Thank you to all my sponsors for all the love and support you give me and the podcast. I couldn't do it without you. Uh, thank you to the listeners for all your love and support. And remember my rule. If you like the podcast, tell everybody. If you didn't, it's our secret. <laughs> <laughs> and um, <That's> fair. <laughs> if you uh, buy stuff from the sponsors, the podcast gets a small commission to help support the podcast. So if you love the podcast, no. Anytime you buy any of the amazing products from the sponsors, you are actually helping me keep the podcast alive because it does take a lot of my time and Penny's time and our team's time to put a good podcast together. So any support you give us. The beautiful thing, if you're buying from my sponsors, you're buying stuff that's very good for you and will only enhance your own life and your family's life. So that's the boomerang of love. Let's keep it going. Lots of love. See you next time with something fun, exciting, interesting, and probably deep. Aho. 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 Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guests, Dr. Nathan Riley and Angie Check. If you enjoyed this podcast, try listening to episode 148 for more with Dr. Riley and Angie Check. Dr. Riley is offering Paul's listeners $50 off your first consultation with him, or you can save 10% on a time bank purchase using the code CHECK10. That's C H E K 10. Go to BelovedHolistics.com. That's BelovedHolistics.com for full details. Dr. Riley also has a collaborator program, which is ideal for coaches and healthcare professionals who seek frequent collaboration with the holistic OBGYN. Find out more at BelovedHolistics.com. You can follow Paul on Instagram at Paul.Check, on Twitter at PaulCheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4 d with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, checkiva.com. Remember, you can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast.